Hello, we are Sunday 31st of May. It is uh, 1.40 p.m. here in uh, Luxembourg. I'm in front of my uh, home. This is where I reside. You see the weather is absolutely beautiful. I'm about to start a walk with my dear Goliath. You see Goliath with his new device to protect his right knee, which is injured, but he's improving nicely. We're going to the physiotherapist twice a week and he does hydrotherapy. So he walks in a special machine in the water, on a treadmill in the water. And this is going to be his first long walk with the, the protective device. So we'll see, we might have some incidents. And because a few minutes ago I realized that I was uh, in a very nice intermittent fasting episode today because I had my dinner, uh, my last meal, early dinner yesterday finished at around 6 p.m. And it's now quarter to 2 p.m. So, you know, I'm uh, about to be in 20 hours of fast, full fast. I had three black coffees today, now it's over, not after 2 p.m. And I had uh, water, uh, probably a decaf yesterday evening. So no food, uh, nothing with any sort of calories, no sweeteners. Sweeteners are not, never a good idea. No sweeteners since yesterday 6 p.m., so almost 20 hours. We're going to walk. I don't know for how long. Obviously the dog decides to a large part. And uh, I'm going to deliver some information about intermittent fasting. In fact, this is the English version of a webinar that I have recorded uh, almost two weeks ago and uh, which appears on my YouTube chain uh, video chain and uh, that uh, webinar I think has, has gathered a lot of uh, information and attracted a lot of attention uh, I must say so I would like to reproduce that information for my uh, English uh, viewers and uh, English patients because I have already noticed in the last two weeks that uh, you see, the dog decides where we are going. We're going up, which is not the best for recording because I might get out of breath. Don't be surprised because there's a steep hill. So this uh, uh, video uh, has been uh, viewed uh, by patients because when I recommend some intermittent fasting strategy to a patient and if they are not aware you know I explain but of course we cannot spend the whole of the appointment in explaining all the details of intermittent fasting so I refer to the to the videos and in fact in French I have three complementary videos about intermittent fasting I'm going to try to wrap up all that within this uh, single English video about intermittent fasting. So uh, let's perhaps start by saying that there's a lot of science now around intermittent fasting, very good evidence. And uh, I have uh, found very groundbreaking, really uh, impressed with this article published in January 2019 in the British Medical Journal, which was recommending to the doctors that their patients who were not having breakfast, you know, that was seen as a big sin until recently, well, doctors are now told not to ask 
those patients who skip breakfast to implement a breakfast. Why? Because they put on weight, they eat more, they eat more calories, and you know the, the trend is, is that we already eat too much. So the outcome of adding a breakfast for patients who don't have breakfast is negative. So when I heard that, I thought, wait a minute, I was limiting the intermittent fasting recommendation to my patients who had a variant genotype in a gene called OGG1. And that gene uh, can go through a polymorphism affecting one area in the gene. And that polymorphism, when variant, so you know, for any polymorphism, you have the wild version, which is seen as the between inverted commas, the normal version, and the variant version, version which uh, uh, in this case is detrimental. It's not always detrimental, but in this case it is, because when OGG1 is variant, already from one copy, so not uh, necessarily both copies have to be variant, one variant is enough to create problems already. And that variant polymorphism leads to a poor repair of DNA. In, uh, among those patients, the DNA repair is reduced either sevenfold if it's heterozygous. So heterozygous means only one uh, copy is faulty. And if it's homozygous variant, so the both copies, in such case, both copies are uh, not doing the job, the DNA repair is reduced up to 20-fold. See, so that's a big deal, very big deal. And clearly, you don't want, well, the dog doesn't want to go this way, so there we go. There's another dog there, which I don't like. It's going to be disturbing a bit, but you know, that's the, the nice aspect of this improvisation. Let's see what happens. So this OGG1 variant is detrimental and something can be done about it because in fact, what can be done is boost the expression of the gene thanks to a sister gene called Sirtuin 3, S-I-R-T-3, S-I-R-T-3, Sirt3. And uh, there are different means to boost those uh, Sirtuins, which are very important uh, genes. You might have heard about that elsewhere. Uh, they are implied in uh, longevity, etc., etc. And the best means to boost cert 3 is fasting. Now, let me uh, go into a little bit more explanation about what I uh, see as the best way to fast. And here we are not speaking about long-term fasts, okay? We, we know where would I mix what I'm explaining today with uh, uh, you know, several days of fasting. Uh, some people can fast for many hours. What would be included in intermittent fasting is, is, is up to 24 hours fast, but not spreading on several days. Okay. Now, intermittent fasting can be done in different ways. What uh, you have heard about initially a few years ago, especially in London, that was very... Uh, popular at some point is the 5-2 fast. So that's five days of eating normally without restrictions and two days of fast, uh, let's say 
hypocaloric fast, relative fast, not full fast, but something like five or 600 calories, perhaps up to 800, but I think it's rather 600 that, that was recommended. So on those days, a very restricted amount of food uh, could be taken in the form of uh, soups or juices or broths or things like that, liquids or not. And then back to a normal fast on the, a normal diet on the other days. So uh, two days of fasting, five days of normal diet. And, and that helped losing some weight. Uh, let me tell you, I, I don't really like it because I feel that is uh, constantly disrupting the habits. You know, you, you, the, the body is, is a bit uh, uh, lost. It's, it's disturbing. You, you go from eating very little uh, to eat what you want on the next day, which will typically mean you're going to eat too much. On that day, you know, I, I can't see a real logic in there. I much prefer this intermittent fasting that I'm promoting today and which I am uh, doing at the moment. So now that we are uh, speaking already for more than 10 minutes, I am uh, hitting 20 hours of, of fast, full fast. And so uh, we could call what I'm doing today a 20 slash four intermittent fast. Okay, 20, the fast. Four is the window of four hours uh, that is left for uh, consuming all the food. So, you will hear a lot about the 18.6 optimal goal for intermittent fasting. So that clearly means 18 hours of fasting uh, and six hours of eating. Well, that's already something pretty tough, pretty, pretty hard. Uh, generally speaking, I'm very, very happy when my patients stick to the 16.8. 16.8 is in fact the standard, okay? 16 hours of fast, eight hours of eating. The 16-8, so the standard intermittent fasting, in fact is slightly misleading because you would think that you fast for longer than you eat. Well, yes, that's true. But what we need to take into account is that when you finish eating, at the end of that eight hour window, you have to provision four hours for digestion. Okay, so in fact, the 16-8 implies 12 hours of eating, digesting, and 12 hours of fasting. The 12 hours of fasting allow your system to cleanse and uh, the cleansing is something very very important called the migrating motor complex MMC it's a specific wave that goes it's a muscular wave that goes through the digestive tract and that uh, uh, allows the, the full refurbishment, you know, and uh, it means getting rid of uh, food debris, undigested foods, overgrowths of uh, yeast or bacteria, unwanted mi microbes, if you want, um, the shedding uh, um, enterocytes, you know, all the cells that cover the intestinal mucosa are uh, shedding at a very fast pace because it's the, the whole thing is renewed every five days, you know, and we have hundreds and hundreds of square meters of that intestinal wall, up to 500 for uh, somebody of uh, normal build. So all those items are cleansed by the MMC and ideally uh, 
we have 12 hours to perform that uh, 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 refurbishment, uh, automatic refurbishment, and then starts the 12 hours during which you can eat and finish to digest, which is going to take four extra hours, eight plus four, 12 as well. That works amazingly, which is why I was recommending that, of course, to my OGG1 variant patients. But now that the BMG itself is uh, admitting that uh, the breakfast is not this uh, compulsory royal meal that uh, you are supposed to have. You know, you start the day with, you, you, eat, uh, you eat like a, a king and then the lunch is uh, a bit what you would get for a prince and then your dinner is the one you would serve to a pauper. Well, that was the old saying, but, you know, that was based on uh, principles, wishful thinking, some logic. Was that b based on science? No, there's no science behind those rules. It just sounds a good idea, but obviously it was not such a good idea. Well, I'm not against three meals, of course, but we have to think about the, the window. The window has to be restricted to allow this long, indispensable refurbishment, which we call uh, MMC. MMC, uh, people are uh, usually aware about that, but they don't understand it properly. MMC is noisy. So when you haven't eaten for a long time and your stomach starts to uh, gargle, well, that is the manifestation of MMC. Now, uh, caring mothers, typically in the past, were saying, oh, uh, that means you're hungry. And of course, because that uh, reflected the situation uh, in which you didn't uh, have food for a long uh, number of hours. And so they thought the demonstration was achieved because they would recommend to have some food which stopped the gurgling. Well, yes, because if you eat, you immediately stop the MMC. But that doesn't mean you have addressed hunger because there was no hunger. There was a cleanse that you have destroyed. So in fact, that was a very bad idea. Uh, delivered, of course, with uh, you know, uh, a, a, a desire to, to care and to help, but uh, that was wrong. You know, with all the tough situations, wars, uh, starvations, etc., that uh, humanity has gone through, it's really in the modern times that uh, we have this excess of, of food everywhere, for well, not everywhere, for sure, but certainly in our uh, industrialized societies. Uh, if you think about all the food that is wasted, I'm not saying it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, shared properly, but there is a global excess of food. Uh, we are living a very different situation, but obviously uh, the, 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 the basic situation humanity has gone through has uh, rather been uh, lack of food. And if you think about uh, ancient times, Paleolithic era, and of course that means millions of years, uh, our ancestor Lucy found in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia, and I've seen her skeleton in uh, Addis Ababa in the Ethnologic Museum. Uh, which was quite an amazing, uh, an amazing visit. Uh, sh her skeleton dates back to 3.2 millions of years. So that's obviously a very long time during which humans have 
struggled with a lack of food. So there's always this instinctive scare that uh, parents will have uh, being afraid that, you know, their, their child uh, is, is hungry and that's why the stomach is noisy. So let's not do that any further. And if you hear those loud noises coming from your stomach while you are implementing this intermittent fasting strategy, well, uh, celebrate and don't kill the, the nice move by uh, eating to stop the noise. It will stop the noise, but that's not a good idea. So this uh, MMC is really a fundamental process which I think explains that our modern intestinal health has deteriorated so much because as nowadays there is a belief that you have to eat when you wake up so that you find the source of energy that enables you to go out and work and often that's not uh, uh, heavy duty manual work as uh, we had to do in different times where we didn't have any machines uh, it was great if you could, could get the, the help of a, of a horse or of some animal uh, uh, to help you in the fields uh, a horse to, to ride and go somewhere but you know the modern life is, is very far from that and still we have this uh, very deeply rooted belief that uh, we we need to eat so that we have the strength to uh, go out drive our car and take uh, a lift and then uh, use a phone or a computer or go into meetings. Uh, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, this modern habit to eat often and with this completely fake belief that you need to eat often uh, perhaps small amounts to multiply the, the meals and the snacks to keep your blood glucose stable. I mean, you know, what's, what's, that, what's that nonsense? This is, where, where is that coming from? Uh, this, is, this is ridiculous. There's zero science justifying that. So those three meals and two snacks or three meals, three snacks just to keep your glucose table but uh, well it's a very good uh, recipe for for pre-diabetes or insulin resistance or perhaps diabetes yes but it's certainly not uh, a great uh, idea and it's certainly not sustained by scientific evidence so with these all these meals and a very limited time for mmc because if you think about a typical timetable for um, contemporary office clerk, for instance, as an example, uh, perhaps because there's commuting, of course, uh, calls, you have to take your breakfast at 7 a.m., and you, have, you go to the office, uh, then uh, you have your day of work, and you have to commute back home, and that is going to take, to take you up uh, down to, down to uh, 8 p.m. for some, some of them, okay? This is nothing extraordinary. And so you might finish eating at 9 p.m., so what exactly is that? It's uh, what we would call a 10-14, 10, 10 hours of fast and 14 hours of eating, okay? Which is completely wrong because when can the, the gut uh, repair itself, you know? 
each cycle of MMC lasts 90 minutes. Ideally, we need eight such cycles to fulfill the job optimally. Okay, eight times 90 minutes, which are the 12 hours. But for someone who is in that 10-14 situation, don't forget that the 14 hours of eating have to be expanded into four extra hours for digestion. So in fact, you only have uh, six hours left for refurbishment and you can only perform four MMC cycles, which is half of the optimum. I like the analogy with uh, the room cleaners coming into offices, you know, or into the, the clinic to, to remove all, all the rubbish and to clean. You would say that the first 90 minutes is uh, pro probably the priority is to, to empty the bins, you know, different types of bins, clinical waste, domestic waste, etc. Uh, sharp bins with the needles. Then the second round of 90 minutes, you're perhaps going to clean the, the sink and uh, start putting things a little bit uh, back in order. And then you need a third one to remove uh, the dust on the surfaces, but then you would uh, be glad to have a fourth one to disinfect uh, all the areas where patients uh, might have been in contact with uh, and then you go a little bit further in depth because then you need to make the floor a bit uh, more shiny or remove stains on certain uh, uh, parts of, 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 of the of the office of on the floor or on uh, the, the bed uh, on which patients lie down, etc. Uh, you know, and then you're going to go really into uh, deeper and deeper cleansing. And then after 12 hours, your uh, consultation room is absolutely pristine. That's what we want for 